Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, Ghosts in the Machine panel, which has been programmed as part of the BFI's In Dreams Are Monsters series. So my name is Chloe Leeson, I am the Editor-in-Chief of Screen Queens and a freelance costume designer, and we are joined here today by a great panel of a mixture of filmmakers, academics and writers. So do people like to introduce themselves? We'll start with Jane first. Hey, I'm Jane Schoenbrunn. I'm a writer-director. Uh, I made a film, came out this year, I guess. I don't know. It came came out over the last few years called We're All Going to the World's Fair um, in post-production on another film that's not about the internet, but I still think about the internet all the time. <laughs> we'll go to Linny next. Oh, hello. I'm Linny Blake. Um, Dr. Linny Blake, I guess, given that I'm here as one of the academics. I founded the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies at Manchester Metropolitan University in 2013 as a sort of centre of studying general, general weird stuff and what it does in, in cultural and historical and, and political terms from the 18th century to the present. Um, so I write about monsters and um, the, the terrors of contemporary life, I guess. And Zepia. Hi, my name is Xavier um, Aldana Reyes, and I'm also um, an academic at Manchester Metropolitan University. I co lead the centre that Lini founded in 2013 at the moment, and I have written on and off about digital horror and online um, horror as well. It's, a, it's an area of interest um, for me uh, ever since I watched uh, The Blair Witch Project and then um, Wreck in 2007, which to my mind is still one of the best um, horror films ever made. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for being here today. So we are here today to talk about technology and screen based horror and how the anxieties and fears surrounding uses of technology are manifesting through filmmaking. Everybody here has at least once seen something on the internet, not a film, something on the internet that was horrific and that they shouldn't have seen that has probably shaped them in some way. I know for me that was Marble Hornets uh, was a big, a big starting point for me. But uh, I think as it makes the most sense as technology changes for us to work um, chronologically through, I guess, the history of screen based horror. So I think we'll start in the 1980s when it started to kind of rise to prominence and this idea of a subgenre called techno horror. And I'm going to come to Jane first about Videodrome, David Cronenberg's 1983 film. And I'm wondering how you feel that that might have been a precursor to, to where we've ended up. We've started on with the, the videos and the TV and how, how has that shaped how the kind of subgenre of techno horror has developed? The Videodrome, obviously not necessarily a film about the internet, but certainly yeah. a film about technology and the relationship between technology and the body and society and identity and the way and reality and the way that um, the screen is is changing our perceptions of ourselves. I mean, the film resonates with me for a number of, of reasons. Um, I, I think just Cronenberg as as um, somebody interested in yeah the, the the evolution of 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 body and identity in in a in a digital or you know, post-digital or pre-digital age, whichever era, decade you're, you're looking at him uh, in. Um, it just has great, great resonance. And I, I don't know another filmmaker whose like project over the last 40 years has been so sort of clear in, in that way. I think Videodrome is an amazing one to look at. And you could certainly point to films about culture or about, um, you know, entertainment or, or about our relationship to the screen made before Videodrome. But um, I, I, I do think, um, you know, as, as, a, as a movie about television and as a movie about a world increasingly mediated through screens of all sizes, um, it, it, it is something of like a, a Rosetta Stone for me or like a Citizen Zero or something. You know, it's, 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 an, it's a wonderful place to start because when I was starting on, on World's Fair and thinking about my own work, you know, as a young filmmaker, you think, um, okay, I don't have a lot of resources, first of all. Um, <laughs> I wanna make resonant work, but I, I, I can't necessarily make, um, you know, my, make, make my magnum opus as my first film. And so you're looking for something to talk about that, um, 
you know, that's that's down to earth. And 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 um, Chloe, this this feeling you describe of being scared on the internet or, or or seeing something on the internet that destabilizes your sense of self was definitely a founding idea for me with World's Fair. Um, but I think that um, there there was also this idea that you know pe people would always say, I'm, I'm you know I'm in my 30s, so so going back to the 90s, like the the adage about like representing the internet or screens on on film was always um, that's not very visual, that's not like an interesting thing to um, to, to photograph, and yet to me I felt that um, it was this invisible thing that I didn't see movies talking about enough this invisible thing structuring like the majority of my day and my life, honestly, increasingly, especially during, um, you know, pandemic times and, 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 you know, even before that with uh, just like the dominance of social media and all of that, like spending so much of my life mediating and narrativizing myself through a screen and understanding myself through this box that reflects me back and shows me other pieces of reality. Um, it felt like 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 the hidden thing that we don't talk about enough in our media and in our movies, um, like like the sort of thing that's taken for granted, right? Like sometimes you, you'll obviously like see characters text or see characters engage with screens in broad ways um, in movies, but um, but but exploring our relationship to the fact that we spend most of our time as human time as human beings right now, like staring into a glowing box. Um, I don't think we have art that's really like giving that the space that it deserves in terms of our our, our current sense of self. And, and Videodrome to me is, is is a movie that's like hyper aware of that and, and, and specifically engaged with this relationship of um, how that relationship, person and, and screen, person and technology is changing our sense of ourselves, um, you know, and I think it's like obviously a very dense movie that that we, you know, we couldn't hope to unpack in the time we have here, mm -hmm. um, but it it really resonates. Yeah, I think it's it's a good starting point. As I say, it, it's not just the internet; it, it's how we've progressed from uh, from from TV to to the internet and then to to later app based things and social media, which we will get onto later. Um, I will say, uh, we're all going to the World's Fair. It gave me this feeling. I just felt like wrong after watching it in the best possible way. It gave me this like most unnerving feeling, which I think, yeah, it's the idea of of being watched and how do how do we uh, view our own relationships to being online. The next one I was going to go on to was um, J Horror's influence on on the genre specifically as kind of a, a nation that's more technologically advanced than we were and the film Pulse and how they log into the internet and the the opening clip of them dialing up and the whole process of, of that coming coming along it I rewatched it this morning and it's just got this like profoundly like really sad element to it um that I think really really comes across with this idea of of spectral beings being trapped inside some form of media or technology that's very uh, prevalent throughout j horror um does anyone have any interesting thoughts on that um i, I think the 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 notion of the 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 technological, especially electronic media, as some sort of portal or something that, that opens up connection with the dead goes back so long, I mean, to, to at least the 1840s and the creation of electromagnetic telegraphy. I mean, quite literally, because I think it was Moore's that, that created it in 1844. And four years later, we had the Fox sisters doing the whole tapping, um, you know, as a way of contacting the dead. And I think it makes perfect sense, doesn't it, in terms of the way that we think about energy as a form of flow and the way that we think about consciousness as a form of flow as well, you know, that sort of connection between liveness, consciousness and some sort of um, telespectral other world makes perfect sense. And so what, what better way to open that, um, you know, the gate to, to the end that the internet, what I think Paul, Pulse does really well, apart, apart from capturing the uncanniness of um, media. You were talking about that crucial scene where um, he's setting up the internet, you know, mm -hmm. apart from <laughs> the uncanny sounds of, you know, we, which um, those of us of a certain generation will remember yeah. of the, the dial up modem making this unholy sounds. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that the moment at which the internet comes alive of its own and, you know, the, the kind of the, the moment where technology starts doing things of its own accord that, that mm -hmm. don't 
don't, um, you know, I mean, technically computers, the internet, it should be something that responds to commands, right? So when it has a life of its own, it's just naturally and inherently uncanny. Mm -hmm. But the film also has a deeper message, as you were saying, Chloe, about um, loneliness. I think one of the ghosts says something like death was eternal loneliness. Um, and I think at one point in the film, the, there's this almost indeterminacy between ghosts and real people. And one of the characters says ghosts wouldn't want to make more ghosts. They would just want to trap you in their loneliness. Right. They want to keep haunting you forever. And I think that idea that the film also uses in a different scene, you know, when we see the dots coming across a screen not quite joining um, is that idea that technology gives us the illusion of connection but it's a very superficial connection one that that it's quite really difficult to build meaningful relationships out of and I think I can't think of a film that's captured that better than than Pulse yeah absolutely it's the bit that get, gets me it's kind of funny but also like I'm sure we can all recognize ourselves in it is when he's looking through the terms and conditions and he's just like what is this next next but we've all been there we don't know what we're getting ourselves into we don't know what we're agreeing to whether that's data sharing what we're about to look at um, and I think that's even though it's a bit of like light-heartedness in that like pivotal scene I think it's it's something that we all recognize in ourselves and a, and a kind of a, a warning sign and I'm sure we all click yes to all the terms and conditions when we logged on this Zoom today. So, <laughs> yeah. So any I, other thoughts I on Pulse? Cookies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so exactly. I'm hoping they don't come after my firstborn, but yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely the case, isn't it? It's, it's like, um, it's one of these wonderful films that I've seen so many times and I'm still not sure that I like care about the narrative in the film, I, I think is also worth mentioning. It's, um, it's like a film that favors mood and atmosphere and mm. like liminality is the word I think of when I think of Pulse. Um, and I, I adore the way that, you know, perhaps it's like my sort of um, saturation of American horror and and like the jump scare as as like the sort of, um, you know, a, a assumed uh, structure of, of, of a horror movie. But the way that Pulse, I think, like anticipates this sort of um, like cursed image idea that the internet will sort of um, attach itself to over the next 20 years and mm -hmm. and really does mine it for like emotionality above all else. Like it's it's incredibly unnerving and filled with dread, but it's ultimately to me like an express a visual expression of yeah, loneliness and depression and um, mm -hmm. and the way that the characters in the film sort of find themselves crossing thresholds in a very liminal way rather than in a very binary way right it's not that like they look at the computer and then they're trapped in the computer but that they move through space until they're in a different kind of space um that really resonates with me as a way to use the language of filmmaking to talk about the surreal experience of, of living in a world mediated by screens yeah Absolutely. So we'll lead on from that, actually. So now that we're, we're sort of in the early 2000s, we've obviously got a really pivotal um, moment in time that kind of shaped our entire world, not just a particular country. We've 9-11 uh, happens. And that is something where people have never seen such levels of of just disaster and kind of carnage unraveling in real time in front of them. And yeah, people's lives are becoming completely dominated by those screens. Um, so Matt Reeves is Cloverfield um, from, is it 2008, somewhere around about there? Um, uh, yes, I think. 2008. Yeah, is a really good example of how um, post 9-11 fears can be communicated through horror cinema. Um, is it Lenny? Would you like to say? Yeah, I, I I chose a bit from Cloverfield to talk about, and and not because, as you say, um, you know, it was a it was a groundbreaking experience of you know unprecedented horror. Although you know it was it was a horrifying thing that happened. What I was really interested in was Americans' response to that horror. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it it did it did emerge in real time, and it was it was shown um, you know globally in real time as it happened. Um, but it, it became very rapidly, the actual event was inextricable from the images of the event. 
um, and the replaying of those images again and again and again, although many were censored, you know, the, yeah. the, the falling man, for example, you know, disappeared until that documentary was made. Um, and is is very much in keeping with the ways in which traumatic memory functions. You know, you experience a horrific event, you you remember it not in terms of the straightforward linear narrative, but in terms of, you know, images and flashbacks and, and strange stuff you may remember, you know, textures or, or smells or, or tiny details. Um, so, you know, Cloverfield for me was a really significant piece of filmmaking because um, you know, and it was still that that excessive or, or continuous use of handheld camera was still, you know, fresh enough to to be very impactful. Um, and, and it was a film in which, you know, the very form of, of the film therefore captured the national trauma um, of the events of 9-11, which, you know, of course, was was an international trauma very rapidly with the with the coming of the war on terror. Um, so yes, it's it's a film that that functions, you know, fabulously as a as a melding of of um, digital stylistics and sort of national psychological trauma. I think it's not as political a film as one may imagine. You know, it doesn't set out to do anything um, other, I think, than than really capture traumatic memory. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean as critics, you know, that we then don't necessarily have a take on it because. Mm -hmm. You know, the 9-11 uh, didn't come out of nowhere um, and it didn't lead nowhere. You know, there was a hell of a lot of, of trauma sandwiching that event. But this captures a very insistently American um, mm -hmm. vision thereof. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's a fantastic film. I it's the symbol this. of... It's this, yeah, so did I. It's the symbol of the the head of the Statue of Liberty, I guess, when that falls. And then there's the scene where they're kind of out on the street and they see... I can't remember if it's like the gap between the buildings mm. and something falls down and it, they just see the smoke coming towards them. Yeah, which the Empire State goes. Yeah, completely like yeah. replicates some like real footage um, from 9-11 that was captured on people's handheld cameras where you just see the wall of smoke heading yeah. towards people as they run away. And I think, yeah, that was a very significant image. But yeah, mm. you're absolutely right. I don't think it was necessarily like a politically intended film because it's a monster no movie, but it? you know it's impossible to escape the politics exactly. of that representation you know why else would you have um you know the empire state thrown up during the great depression creating yeah. work for america's disenfranchised and obviously the head of of um of lady liberty herself you mm -hmm. know there's there's a lot of politics in there but it wears it sufficiently um lightly um to allow for a lot of different readings of the film Mm -hmm. I think it's it's quite similar to um, George A. Romero's Diary of the Dead mm -hmm. in terms of the, the political links that we can make. And I'm wondering how you view maybe that film in terms of comparing it with uh, how like the COVID-19 pandemic was handled in terms of our news cycle mm -hmm. and how we're witnessing these events unraveling in real time. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have to, uh, you know, preface it with a statement of my love of Romero and the fact that Dawn of the Dead was the first scary movie that I went to see in the cinema, uh, pretending to be old enough to see it. And it broke me. I must have been about, I don't know, 14 at the time. And, uh, I, you know, it, it set me on a on a very dubious path ever since, I think, in terms of my interest in this stuff. And it is very much a Romero film, but it's very much a Romero film of the digital age in that, you know, having made, you know, very, um, you know, predictable, classical, um, you know, style movies hitherto. This is the point at which he picks up the camcorder through a cast of of young filmmakers who just happened to be making a, a horror film um, out in the Pennsylvania woods when um, the zombie apocalypse happens. Um, and the whole conceit of the film, you know, because he doesn't go for the um, Cloverfield uh, style um, found footage. He does have a kind of frame where, you know, the filmmaker who who assembles what what becomes the body of the film explains why she did it and why she did it was essentially to hold the news media to account because the news media um uh, lie <laughs> astonishingly um and uh, and in this film they they do the kind of um it's a hoax style 
um, claims about the, the zombie apocalypse that, you know, a lot of people were putting forward subsequently about COVID-19. So it, it's a it's a, a film that's very critical of the of the responsibilities of the news media globally, not just in the United States. Um, uh, uh, but uh, and as such, you know, it, it indicts the ways in which we're all creatures manipulated by what has now come to be termed the mainstream stream media uh, into behaving in particular ways. Um, the problem with doing that, I think, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, you know, yay, that's a that's a solidly um, liberal position to take. The problem with doing that, of course, is is any kind of undermining in the possibility of the truth being out there anyway. And our central filmmaker character does mine the Internet for um, sort of sources of information that is actually telling the truth about what's happening. Um, but but interestingly, the film ends with two sort of plaid shirt wearing rednecks um, getting their jollies on on uh, destroying the bodies of the dead, you know, with with large weaponry, etc. Um, so it seems to me, you know, not only does it critique the news media, but it also sort of preempts or, or looks forward to. Um, that kind of alt-right questioning of any truth coming out of the mainstream media uh, that would, of course, give us, you know, Trump's alternative truths, alternative facts, um, and indeed calls to civil in insurrection on the streets of the capital. So, you know, it's a it's a very, very clever film and, and uh, a very engaging and intermittently very scary one, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting how you're just talking about uh, like responsibilities of the filmmakers. So whether that's whether we're talking about um, news people in general and their responsibilities to document what is really happening mm -hmm. or uh, fictional filmmakers who are potentially maybe creating films that might be I'm trying to think of things like the Blair Witch Project that kind of had the, um, you know, the magic around it surrounding um its production and the making out like these people had gone missing. Uh, Jane, I'll come to you as a filmmaker. Do you feel like any responsibility towards telling stories that could be spun up in the internet into these like uh, creepy pasta conspiracy level, or is that part of the fun? No judgment, because I would say it's part of the fun. <laughs> and I don't. I don't think I think a ton about. I think a lot about responsibility as a filmmaker. I don't necessarily think a lot about um, like what kind of bad actors could do with work, you know, yeah. or I don't necessarily think about like my films as like intentional subterfuge, except maybe in like a crude markety way, like, you know, yeah. like, oh, like, wow, that, you know, like, um, I just saw this wonderful film. I, I think everyone on this call should watch it if they haven't already. This one, Skinamarink, um, that's sort of- um, I've heard about gone, it, yes. Gone viral on the internet. And um, it really, to me, does. It, it feels like the closest thing I've seen to like a true creepy pasta movie, um, you know? And um, and I, 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 I don't think of World's Fair as that because I, I did build into World's Fair um, as Linny was talking about, like a frame, you know, there there is a third person camera in my mm -hmm. film. Um, it's not found footage. It's not trying to convince you that it's real. Nor is Skin and Marink, but it, it that that's a film that feels to me so exceptionally um, cursed, you know, or 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 or, or, or tailor made for the internet to debate. I think in the way that you're asking about Chloe, um, in the way that when I was 12 and I'll age myself now, and you know, watched the. Blair Witch Project trailer on dial-up, um, you know, part of the fun was like th this this myth that that maybe this could be real. Um, and obviously I made an archival documentary that that's not currently in release, but that um, was a very important project to me about the Slenderman um, mythos and the stabbing and um, and a lot of the questions that that raised about sort of like, um, you know, the, 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 the bounds of truth and fiction on the internet, which um, is something that my film is all of my work is really engaged with, but I think I'd come down on the side of like the responsibility of the artist is, you know, in, in a world where where truth and fiction are, are are so easily manipulated and inevitably manipulated, perhaps even given the structures of our, uh, you know, of, of, of the way in which we consume right now. Um, I can't, I don't think that the artist ha like should be striving for like, 
disclaimers and and warnings and truth you know that that that's the journalist's responsibility i i, I think um and, and doc, even documentary is is not journalism that said i mean i i i think like what do i think my personal responsibility is as a filmmaker i i think it's to um be aware of the landscape that i'm working within what that means as an american filmmaker primarily is is art versus commerce and um there's no such thing in in this country uh, that that i'm in a, a making movies freely right like there will always be i think there's probably no such thing as that anywhere but um mm-hmm. but you know we don't have government funding for movies so you have to engage with the commercial system and you have to engage with a system that um has a very different priority right like the priority of the hollywood commercial system is to maximize eyeballs money entertainment which will you know like usually mean making work that isn't truthful to my lived experience in a strange time in a bad place as a person you know who's not viewed as a full person because of my identity um and i think my experience is to uh, or, or or my responsibility when i when i set out to, to make work that will be shared with audiences is to the other audiences that i want to be talking to and talking to them in a way that will be resonant and also hold them like um you know there, there are a few oblique references to suicide in my first film and the new film i think talks about really painful things that for people who come from especially trans experiences will will be hard to watch um and so i think about my responsibility less as like one to like the the capital t truth um because art is an investigation and it's not it's not a it's it's, it's not an explanation um and I think about my responsibility more as like an emotional one to sort of be, um, to be nurturing and and to think of art making as care work in some way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fantastic. That's so, so I, I, sorry, I did a ha there and I didn't mean <laughs> that as a ha. I, I meant, I, 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 I'm very interested in the, in the ways in which art in general, but horror movies in particular have the capacity to engage with trauma. Um, you know, and I, I do think um, that that our engagement with horror films uh, can be profoundly healing in a way that engaging with other genre, you know, cinema isn't, you know, because horror is out there. It is on the edge. It is, you know, the most censored of the movie genres and it does deal with material that, you know, is way out there. So that was a heart of recognition and, and entire agreement um, with that. Um, and it's it's something that people who aren't horror types simply fail to understand. They don't understand mm-hmm. what I have called healing through horror. Um, I, I, I think it's real. And I think, you know, every time I do a film festival, uh, the topic seems to come up and, and audiences are uh, so remarkably open horror, particularly horror festival audiences, I think, to engaging with precisely the kind of questions that, that you were raising there in a very open and and kind of sorted way. You know, I think maybe we deal with a lot of our crap through horror mm-hmm. um, and it makes us, you know, a, a, an interesting community of producers in your case, obviously, critics in me and Zavi's in, but in all our cases, fans as well. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to say on that one? Um, I was, uh, uh, the, the whole sort of 9-11 trauma thing kept me thinking, you were asking before, Chloe, what was that sort of screen moment for us? And I think cinematically for me, it was the Blair Witch Project, because like Jane, I was still of a, an age where I could mm-hmm. almost believe in this urban legend that people really had gone missing. And that um, yes. if you went and watched it at the cinema, you were somehow going to be a, a part of this terrible thing. So that, that was for me the formative um, filmic one. But then, of course, um, 9 11 as a real event was really I mean I, I still vividly remember the day it happened and how I was rushed to the, the the TV screen to get the images and the information and how it was happening live that had never really you know happened in, in in my life before that moment you know you were kind of relying on on the TV for the indexicality of the truth weren't you and it was happening live as well um I think cinema just couldn't be the same after uh, after those events so if the Blair Witch Project was already um 
suggesting that, that cinema was going to have to use different interfaces. I think 9-11 just changed the narrative and the stylistics of cinema. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think hence the rise of found footage um, mm -hmm. from, from then onwards. Yeah, I, I think there's there's a big thing in the horror community of you're always looking for like the next thing, like what's what's the next hit that you can get that's going to be uh, pushed further than the next thing. And I think we find those things through the exploration of different mediums. Um, as mentioned, Marble Hornets before that absolutely, I didn't even finish it. That absolutely terrified me. Like I lived down a dark alley at the time and I would stand at the end of my road and cry and text my mum to come and get me because <laughs> just the I, the format in which it was presented was so believable. Um, and I think I'd like to touch back on Slenderman actually, because I think that's obviously a really important case with a real world problem that got attached to it. Um, and obviously the film after the creepy pasta happened there was marble hornets and then there was the horrific film um with was it joey king that was in in the movie i think some some girl <laughs> does anybody have any thoughts on slender man and how how we kind of find that merge of the thing that's happened on screen that's been delivered via like blog posts it's been in written form and then it's been kind of snowballed into this larger cultural myth i um the documentary that I made, which actually started as a, almost like a mood reel in, in early research on, on World's Fair um, and, and ballooned into it, its own project. Um, it's like an all archival documentary uh, entirely built out of footage from YouTube, um, sort of tracing the history of Slender Man, but not really like interested in the actual content of it, more interested anthropologically and sociologically in, in like the way that um, the, this myth is created and, and, and spread and, um, and ultimately the way that like truth and fiction continue to swallow each other, right? That um, creepypasta as a movement is so fascinating, you know, because like, like folklore, it's, 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 it's trying to convince you that it's real, right? And those the the the, the rule that I, the thing that I found so resonant on R slash no sleep, which is the um subreddit where um where where a, a, you know like creepypasta currently lives on the internet, one of their rules which says um everything is true here, even if it's not. Mm -hmm. And this um this call to um you know all playing this game of 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 um perhaps not creation of reality, but at the very least creating a space where um where fiction can be real. Um, I found that complex. Um, I found that disturbing, you know, and in, in, in the documentary, for instance, you see footage about the Slender Man stabbing, which is a very real thing that happened, obviously. And then you see footage from like YouTube denial of people telling you why that event never took place and is mm. a false flag. Um, and the, you know, like in the same way that truth and fiction continues to refictionalize itself, then there is a lifetime original movie about this stabbing event, which was inspired by fiction and then became reality and then is refictionalized and recommodified. Um, and that interaction is fascinating to me. Um, and Slenderman certainly has like the, 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 the biggest export of this medium, this I think new medium and a medium that could only exist on the internet. Um, is uh, yeah, it's is a really significant example of the ways in which our changing technologies are changing our, I think forms, I think story forms, right? Like the the structures of the medium have have completely changed. That something like that would not have been possible in um, the news media of like the fifties or something. Mm. That's so interesting. I'd love to. I'd love to see that doco that you made, Jane. Is it? Is it? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I have. I have a complicated relationship to it because it. Um, I never monetized it. You know, I, I released it for free on the internet, and then when I started working on um, World's Fair, I just kind of pulled it down. It, it played at some festivals. I. I pulled it down because I wanted World's Fair to be the thing that people saw first, and. I'll probably, I, I kind of just want to like put it on the pirate bay, honestly. I um, <laughs> Send me a Vimeo link. <laughs> I'll send you a Vimeo link. It, it, it feels complicated to try to, to, to like sort of have out there because it's using a lot, especially like YouTube footage of like underage kids talking yeah, about yeah. the Thunder Man. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's complicated. Yeah. But, but I do think anthropologically, it's a significant uh, moment that deserves 
to be reflected on. Absolutely. I, I was really taken with what you, you that relationship that you drew between folklore and creepypasta. Um, because, you know, it, it, what is creepypasta but the kind of folklore of the new flesh? Mm. It's uh, it's exactly taking us into uh, in it, in the sort of historically very flat space that is the internet, you know, where everything is simultaneity, everything's happening at once. Um, you know, you you haven't got those sort of centuries of accretion of folkloric ideas. Um, you you've got Slender Man, which obviously draws on you know the scary man who takes away children, which is as old a you know, a figure as folklore itself, but it's done in such an insistently, um, you know, internet age fashion. It is, it is the child of the internet, but it is also profoundly folkloric. It's a really interesting comparison, I think. Folklore of the new flesh, Linny, that is sensational. <laughs> I absolutely love that. <laughs> I'm going to get that tattooed. <laughs> That's so good. I've got a PhD student, Leone, who intermittently writes things like that down. And we're, <laughs> we're going to form a band that <laughs> entitles all of these things. That's so another band title for Leone. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Xavier, do you have anything to add on Slenderman? Yeah, I, I think, sure. I think Slenderman definitely is the, the digital horror par excellence, not just uh, because of the way that it manifests and what it does to technology, but that crowdsourcing element that we were talking mm. about that is truly multimedia in that, you know, it starts in the something awful forums with a couple of, um, you know, portraits or pictures that have been digitally altered and then people start writing backgrounds to it and retrojecting uh, the monster back in time as Linny was saying the problem with the internet is history well you just invent it don't you mm. you sort of bring back the send man back in time and then before you know it someone is making marble hornets and giving it an entirely different background story um, so it's really interesting to see what what aspects of the Slenderman remain right and, and why they do so um, so I think yeah I find it fascinating we teach actually the Slender Man on, on our MA programme and um, students are always fascinated by it because it's a, a, a digital uh, monster of their age and one that they thoroughly understand so mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic so I think as we're, we're kind of getting into the 2010s now and we're starting to see real screen based uh, laptop screen based uh, horror movies like Unfriended. So I'm wondering, Xavier, if you might have any any thoughts on where, when did the shift happen when we started moving from the kind of VHS found footage shaky cam to the on screen and why you think that might have been? So there's an early uh, sort of outlier, the Collingswood story, which is slightly earlier than this in the 2000s. I can't remember the exact year now, I think it might be 2005 um, around then, that sort of was suggesting the, the potential for this. But Unfriended really captured this moment because it doesn't just use the desktop interface, you know, really, really well live, so to speak, in, in a way that would be um, replicated or, you know, um, changed by films like Host. But if you actually look at uh, the film in a, under a cold light, it's almost like a, a cross section of where technology was in 2014. The film uses Facebook, YouTube, uh, but I made a list actually Instagram, Chat Roulette, uh, Skype, Live League, Google, Gmail, like literally all of the apps. Uh, Already feels programs. like a little bit of a relic, doesn't it? Like <laughs> Skype. What's Skype? We don't use that anymore. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old, I guess. We, um, um, we chat, we chat World Fair like right before the pandemic and used Skype in it and, ah. and it, it instantly dated. Oh, no. <laughs> that's, uh, that's always going to be the issue with found footage, isn't it? Because it's mm. so reliant on the technology that, that creates it. But I think what I really like about it is not just how it uses this interface, but how it suggests, because obviously the horror of the film is there's this spectral hacker, this troll that's going to suddenly uh, reveal of your dirty secret secrets because we all have them and where are they stored nowadays they're stored on your laptop they're stored on your um history on your you know your your browser history so i think it really captures those concerns really well but it also captures where we live our lives currently um i was um, digging for some facts and and data and it's actually really scary the average person spends seven hours a day online and spends two and a half hours on social media every day and i'm pretty sure that's actually higher for the younger um, generations than it is for the older generations. So it does make sense, doesn't it, that horror starts telling its stories through that interface. If we're living our lives digitally, 
um, and not just literally so by, you know, banking and shopping online, but storing it, curating it mm. online in social media, that that is what comes, uh, you know, that's what un that's what's under pressure and under threat of being invaded, that those properties, that that becomes a property. And of course, the other thing as well is that in the digital age, our most um, precious asset is our personal data so um, maybe that's me being excessive excessively kind to uh, unfriend it because it doesn't necessarily hint at this but i see in it a covert critique of surveillance capitalism um, and the way that you know th there are just very physical um, data um, trails that our computers leave behind and that they are, that are marketable um, and and um, sellable to companies uh, mm -hmm. and uh, i think unfriended sort of captures that really really well as well as things like um, digital attacks, you know, like revenge porn, because uh, the, the film is pretty much about that as well, yeah. isn't it? Laura Barnes getting back, getting her own back for, for the things that she was done, the humiliation that she suffered. So yeah, from the interface to its message, to um, what it says about um, how our lives are, are stored, I think it's the most fantastic film about desktop horror, about online horror, as we might call it. Yeah, the surveillance idea, I think, is something that is is very prominent in Unfriended. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, Jane, as someone that has made a film that is partially screen based, um, how do you think the experience translates when it's because you had a theatrical run for World's Fair, didn't you? Uh, it did come to my local cinema. So how do you think that experience of of the screen based film translates to the theatrical experience as opposed to watching it at, on your laptop at home? It was really important to, to me to, and it was honestly like one of the founding sort of ideas with World's Fair was to um, think really deeply about this question of like how to represent um, the the internet and this, and not just the internet literally, but like the how it feels to use the internet in in cinematic language. Um, and so I and I, I you know I the film as much as it's influenced by like uh, something like Pulse, um, you know, it, it takes a lot from slow cinema. It takes a lot from, from you know, like Simon Lang is, is a big influence. A Peach Pong is a big influence and um, wanting to, definitely a goal was to make something that 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 could be enjoyed or should be enjoyed in, in a theater and with the lights down and like the, 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 the experience, the dreamlike experience of like being surrounded by, by cinema, um, that, that, that was, a goal and um you know and thinking just a lot about like how to merge the art cinema that i love with the creepy pasta like dread 2 a.m thing that the film is discussing and um and and to me that was like a lot of grain a lot of um a lot, a lot of like um compression you know I, i'm fascinated by in the same way that filmmakers have um like a relationship to vhs in the contemporary times like the buffering of an early youtube video as like something that can be dreamlike and haunting and beautiful and the way we move through space was a big thing right like this sort of pulling in and out of screens in this very fluid way similar to what I was talking about with Pulse um I, I really like uh, the, the film is designed as a as a cinematic experience and then the pandemic happened and we premiered virtually at Sundance um you know and and, and literally everyone was like this is the perfect film to watch on a laptop and um mm -hmm. and it's not I, I don't have I'm not oppositional to that idea um but I do think my film is one that um, doesn't reward casual viewing, you know, or like it's, it's oh, yeah. trying, there's a certain, there's a language I think that we have now, which is like Netflix language of, um, you know, like I'm going to sit down and, and check Twitter while having a horror film on in the background and it will please me by like letting me half watch it. And, um, and, and this is perhaps like the way that a lot of people are watching films now mm -hmm. entirely. Um, like, I, you know, I, I think that the population that engages with cinema as an art form is maybe not extensive at this point, mm. and, and, and people are much more used to this sort of passive watching experience, um, half watching experience, and, and I just don't know a way to work in that medium as an artist that is going to let me speak in a complex language or like a language that will be able to say something complex. Um, mm. And so this is why I, I think I, I make a film that can't, that that like, I am drawing a line of like, if you're gonna half watch this, you're not gonna have an experience with it. Very engaged in my work with, um, you know, I'm in the right place. Uh, no one knows who this is in, in the US, but perhaps on this call, Mark, Mark Fisher's work and um, ah. the, the, idea, the idea of hauntology. Um, yeah. 
is is something that like I describe my work as ontological in, in a lot of ways. And, and to me, it's, it's a useful idea because mm. I don't know that it's nostalgia that I'm trying to um, conjure always. Mm. Um, you know, I think nostalgia is very powerful, but I think it's more, um, I think there are political implications to it and, 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 and something sinister, right, about um, the longing for, or like what you can represent with that kind of like digital noise or VHS. Mm -hmm. um, fuzz um mm. like what what are we trying to conjure backwards um mm. with that is 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 I, I think and it's a big part of um what what I go looking for when I'm like talking about media in films mm. and I think it has a lot to do with um like the liminality of being raised in a way where like I like I think a lot in my work about yeah this real this psychic relationship between oneself and the screen and like when you're a young person, like you were talking about, Lenny, coming up in a world where that's a given uh, yeah. and where so much of your experiences are being like, um, like, like the new movie is about television. Um, and it's, uh, it's all about the, the experience of being like a young person growing up in the suburbs here in, in, in New York and, um, and seeing the suburbs reflected back to me on a screen in a, in a romanticized mm. way and, and, want, and, and the, the way that reality and that reflection merge um in one's memory and in one's values and, and and way of walking through the world and and i think that's this is like a fascinating thing about screens is that relationship that we have where it creates us right it's a technology that we created that creates us mm. certainly and and one that affects uh, the, the language of cinema because um jane your film is really interesting in that it's very slow um you know it, it's deliberately slow whilst we find that a lot of these digital um horrors mm -hmm. are the complete opposite i was talking to Linny recently about this 2016 film called sick house which was allegedly entirely shot through snapchat videos which of course are limited to 10 seconds so like the entire film is made of this short up to 10 second scenes um that are then you know brought together for the the official release that you can buy and, and watch and it creates a very different type of narrative experience when your concentration is switching you know from mm. one moment to another every 10 seconds I think it does speak to that uh, to what we were mentioning before about our attention spans and how um, you know if something lasts longer than 10 or 15 seconds if the camera stays static for longer than that we switch to our phones that second um, interface to give us that other um, yeah I, I think what I'm trying to say is I think technology is not changing just the way we communicate but and the way that we consume things but also the way that we make them mm -hmm. and I think what makes um um we're all going to the world's fair so interesting is that it doesn't it sort of um goes for a much slower uh, much more ponderous um you know look at that technology yeah I think it's hypnotic personally that was just like <laughs> transfixed it's, it's one of the reasons why I, i'm so fascinated right now it's this film skin and which i i think you guys will will really be interested in because it it's so so slow it's punishingly slow it's so much slower than my film my film has narrative oh <laughs> and um and yet like in the last two weeks you know it's like really taking like the letterbox like when i when i watched it it had maybe like 700 logs and it's like pushing 10,000 now it, it's 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 really taking off and um and it's not even released, is it? It's just on its no, festival it's, run, is that correct? It's being pirated. Um, being pirated, yeah, seeing yeah, the filmmaker uh, sharing. And um, and it's so slow, I, you know, but I watched it, like my partner was, fell asleep 10 minutes in and, and I turned off all the lights and sat there on the couch and made this like creepypasta-esque ritual of it. And, um, and it was honestly the most scared I've been in my adult life watching a movie because it 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 totally foregoes anything except for that feeling of of dread um, that, oh. and if you watch you know like what if you watch Marble Hornets or if you watch like a lot of um, internet work is incredibly slow it's it's so arduous on purpose um, and to me there is this really interesting relationship of like like twenty years ago an experimental slow film would have been received in a very different way than it is now or like our relationship to slowness like we're willing to slow down if it's like a challenge or something you know if it's like an internet challenge we'll slow down it's just really interesting it's strange mm -hmm. that is absolutely true um yeah it's interesting that you talk about slowness actually because i was just thinking about uh, just the instant gratification of 
of the social media and especially the use of uh, technology on our phones and kind of moving into the the more recent um screen based technology based horror films and thinking things like nerve which is obviously like an app is it app based of them asking them to do challenges and things like countdown which was a horrible film but the app that was released that was attached to it um where you could log on and find when you were going to die 10 out of 10 so so where do we think that things are developing now because we, we just talked about host previously um that kind of used the Zoom call and obviously utilised the situation that they were in in the pandemic to to create something honestly terrifying and so short. I love a short movie. Uh, So where do we think we're going? Because we haven't really delved too much into the idea of like app-based horror that's that's being created by an app rather than just a phone in general. Or just people know of any that I don't know about? Hmm. The one I was familiar with was was Sick House as a as a film mm-hmm. told through Snapchat. I haven't seen, I must confess, Nerve or, or Countdown, but I will seek them out immediately because I'm really interested in all of this. I think um, what creates a, a difference, I think, is whether you truly are shooting those films on the app or whether you're replicating the app. Yeah. I mean, I this I don't know about even Unfriended, whether Unfriended replicates all of those interfaces or whether it's truly told through them and whether it's it's told in lifetime, because allegedly that's what made Sick House so interesting. Again, the blurring of the urban legend is this really happening because um, the main character is an actual um, influencer using their account to tell the story. So, of course, if you follow this person, and you suddenly notice that the posts are heading somewhere really dark and you don't know it's a film, then that completely changes the dynamic, doesn't it? That Mm -hmm. turns the app into the, you know, the answer to the question. Whilst if it's just something that's woven into the narrative as part of a bigger frame, I think that that does something completely different. Yeah. There was something on TikTok a while ago. This was maybe last year. And I'm not sure what it was called, but it was some kind of app that was telling people to go to a specific location and they would find something strange there. And I ended up in this lockdown rabbit hole and it was horrible. I don't don't know how much of it was faked or if people were reading into it, but people were going to this location and they were finding, you know, abandoned cars, um, broken dolls and like all the classic horror tropes that you want to see. And I was just on this tag searching and searching and searching for more stuff. So when... Where, where do we think it's going to head? I'd like an opinion from everyone. Where do you think that screen-based horror is going to go in the future? I reckon interaction. I reckon interaction. I think we saw an example of what that can look like with things like uh, Black Mirror Bandersnatch. You know, it's mm-hmm. very limited and it choose your own adventure. But that idea of putting you in the place, um, surely that, you know, I've, I've seen lots of... Um, development is being made with VR horror as well but um you know the the capacity to sort of um generate movement for example is still quite limited because it's just so labor intensive just to create that, that that you know maybe a five minute um film so I reckon bit by bit it will be more interactive we're always constantly on on the search for um total immersion aren't we so I yeah. reckon it'll be something like that you won't see me playing those apps though <laughs> I'm not going on the hunt for cre- creepy dolls thank you very much yeah <laughs> I'll I think stay it, on my couch was it Eli Roth that just did the VR horror Thing at Halloween I think he did some kind of VR experience with um, Vanessa Hudgens in she was like the the main character if you could call it that in a VR experience uh, so yeah that is very interesting Linny what do you have to say I don't know um I'm not necessarily interested in digital horror uh, per se I'm interested in what digital horror gives us the ability to think about and talk about and feel Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and a a lot of the films that, you know, we've all mentioned, you know, from Videodrome in particular, um, which I also saw in the cinema um, when it came out and have never been the same since. Um, uh, From uh, from Videodrome, you know, through to, to a lot of the movies that we've talked about, all of these films, you know, make phenomenal formal usage of the possibilities offered by new technologies you know, whether that be, you know, light handheld video cameras or, or um, you know, the internet itself, surveillance footage um, and the like. But they do so, uh, 
to say things, you know, to say things about the horror of the world that we inhabit, you know, whether that's as, as you know, global subjects or as, or as subjects of capitalist realism, if you're a Mark Fisher fan, as I too am, um, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, you know, whether uh, to say something about, you know, our, our existence as, um, you know, sexual beings or as gendered beings. Um, so in a way, I hope that, that there will be a, a sort of resurgence of, of the politics of digital filmmaking. Um, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, we do since 9-11 live in a world that is incredibly surveilled, you know, in which our, our, you know, we're not only physically watched and in the UK in particular, you can't go outside the house without something physically watching you or whether we're surveilled in terms of our Internet usage, you know, and our, our search histories or or, you know, our Twitter histories or, or whatever. So I don't know. I don't know what's coming next, but I hope it's going to be more sort of overtly politically engaged and yeah. I, I think the whole Trump phenomenon and the ways in which digital technologies you know brought about you know a, an attempted coup on the streets of Washington um, offers phenomenal material for for digital horror filmmakers and for digital filmmakers but you know the the horror of of what's been going on in the in the US since 2016 you know is is as the purge franchise you know a lot of which makes mm -hmm. use of digital um, techniques, you know, the horror of what's actually happening there is is uh, is beyond anything that you know can, has been imagined in in popular cinema. So, you know, I hope the the effect of that is a, a sort of I don't know a radical digital filmmaking that that you know um, not only analyzes what's what's going on but you know offers offers a critique of it and a and a route map out hopefully i know that's a lot to lay on the filmmaker you know show us <laughs> show us where to go but you know the best films do kind of do that in ways i yeah. think and the best horror definitely does does yeah. it i think i think we're we're getting the the societal uh messages are are coming through in the kind of prestige horror elevated horror all oh. of that uh, all that nonsense um but yeah it would be really nice to see it be yeah. be brought through into into digital forms jen i mean i want to just uh rah rah rah, rah what, what lenny said i i think that 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 feels exactly right to me um I think I would share that like when I was when I was trying to figure out how to make we're all going to the World's Fair and it's part of why I made like an archival film I was I was like I, I, I was really struggling with this question of like the logic of found footage and how the logic of found footage really bumps up against it's I think it's a very conservative form in its way I think it um I think there are amazing things that you can do with it, but the the rules of logic um that it that it dictates to you are are incredibly limiting like um. I remember at one point I was like, okay, I'll make the whole film like sort of like the algorithm, right? Like the, the whole film as sort of um, like, a, like a stream of videos and the searching for the like the justification on top of what I was creating felt, um, I ultimately was like, I won't be able to speak a language that will let me say the things that I wanna say if I, if I create a logic of found footage. Like if I create a logic of a first person camera that can all be traced back to like, someone's videos or something recorded on a desktop or a stream of videos like I needed a third person camera I needed an omniscient filmic narrator um because I, I think that um it allowed me poetry and like, like you know the fact that like I could go and wander and dream in the way that I wanted to dream without like setting rules for myself and the film is still like incredibly structured but just in a different way, in a non-first person way. And I, if I had to like labor a guess, I would say that um, the, like what a post found footage horror landscape could look like, isn't like a reversion to where we were before found footage, but it's sort of like found footage becomes um, like taken for granted almost, right? It, it's like, um, like uh, we, we understand that most of what we watch is on screen so we don't need to be told that we're watching TikToks, you know um and and thus like the the artist is liberated a little bit to speak in that language and have a shorthand with the an audience who's hyper familiar with uh you know like consuming art in or or, or media um via 
first person sources, but that the, the artist isn't beholden to that. Um, and I think once you, once you sort of like free the artist from that, like very, um, very like logic based way of making work, I, I think it opens like a lot of extraordinary possibilities to like d dig into depths. Um, I, this is sort of like a heady answer, but I, I think that um, cursed image cinema is what I would call it, right? Like cinema that like isn't like, and here's a cursed image and here's where it came from. And here was mm -hmm. the investigation that happened afterwards, but that is like more interested in the emotional weight of that without being sort of weighed down by logic. Who needs logic? Absolutely. I think that is an absolutely fantastic answer that we should probably end on because that is the end of my questions for you. So thank you very much to all three of you for your wonderful insights today. It has been an absolute joy to listen to. And Jane, I will absolutely be watching your documentary as soon as we've hung up this call. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you.